Good morning. We're in Exodus 4 today. Let's go ahead and pray, and we will get started on this passage. Father, Father God, um, you are so good to us, so patient with us. Please help us um, come before your word today with hearts of submission, um, hearts that have faith that you will speak to us. Please allow us to be soft and ready to receive what you would teach us and help us to, to work diligently through your word, knowing that you have something for us and trusting that every word is important and there for a reason. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and read Exodus chapter 4. <clears throat> then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then, then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. 
It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood, because of the circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. God's word to us today. There is a lot in this passage. Um, Let's observe. And it's important, I think, and I've said this before, take some time, make your own observations. If all you do is listen to my observations... Um, it probably just sounds like summarizing the text. And that's basically what it is Um, as I go through these. The important thing is that as you work through the act of observing and summarizing, you are having to encounter the text on a different level. So this summarization is actually forcing you to observe the text to make sure you get the summary correct. That's one of the values of summarizing something is that it forces you to observe. So take some time, actually do your own observation, write something down, join me back here in this video after you've done that. And here we go with the observations. Moses tells God that people won't believe the Lord appeared to him. God gives Moses three signs to perform, the staff to the snake and back again, leprous hand and back again, and water changed to blood. Moses tells God he is not eloquent. God assures him that as creator of man's mouth, he will be with his mouth. Moses asks God to send someone else. God becomes angry with Moses. He tells Moses that Aaron will speak for him, but Moses will speak to Aaron. Moses hears from God that it is time that is it is time to go to Egypt because the men seeking his death are dead. Um, Moses almost dies on the way to Egypt until his wife circumcises his his son. Moses meets Aaron and tells him what God has spoken to him. Moses and, Moses and Aaron gather the elders of Israel and they they say what God told them, show the signs, and they and the people believe, bow their heads in worship. Okay. Application interpretation. Or interpretation and application. Um, All right. We see a lot of doubt here from Moses. We see... um, He starts off with a doubt. God has just told him what will happen. And Moses' first response is, well, they're not going to believe me. Um, Through this whole passage, God is very patient with Moses' doubts. When God becomes angry is when Moses flat out says, basically, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. Then God becomes impatient. (laughs) Not impatient, he's being patient, but becomes angry. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses after he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. God has been addressing all of his doubts and saying, no, I'll do this, I'll do this. Look, I'm telling you what's going to happen. I'll do this. It's interesting to me that God gives him these three miracles that he's going to perform. And um, it's, they're they're incredible. I mean, if someone did these things in in front of me, I would be amazed turning a staff into a snake and then picking it up and, and it turns back into a staff. That would be amazing. Having your hand, you know, 
become leprous and then healed again immediately, um, turning water into blood in front of someone's eyes. Uh, it would be amazing to me, um, and I'm used to seeing all kinds of amazing stuff on TV um, through the magic of con computer-generated graphics, um, it would have been much more amazing for people in this time to see this. They, they're not used to seeing the laws of nature defied. Our, our eyes are kind of used to being tricked, uh, but they would not have been used to that. But I think, I think God saves the, um, the, the greatest miracle the, to be number four here, and it's the one that Moses refuses to do. He says, O oh Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. What he's saying is, I'm not eloquent and I never have been. So returning to Egypt, everyone who knew Moses would have known him, apparently, as someone who was not eloquent, who did not speak well. And Moses note, knows that about himself. So it must have been something. We are rarely self-aware, especially this self-aware. So I'm thinking if Moses is this insecure about his speech, it may be because people noticed it about him and either teased him or, or whatever, or, or just took note of it. Um, maybe... Um, this, well, obviously I'm still, I'm getting again into a lot of conjecture here, but um, this could be a uh, the root of a lot of his insecurity and anger that he hasn't dealt with. But whatever the case, he is known as not being eloquent by himself and by people in the past, in his past. And God tells him this, or asks him this, who has made man's mouth? It's a rhetorical question. Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? And then he answers his rhetorical question. Is it not I, the Lord? I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. The previous doubts, God said, okay, I'll give you these signs so that they know that I spoke to you. And, and this doubt, God says, I will give you a miracle. This will be the another miracle that it will be a sign. If, if Moses had returned and allowed God to perform this, no, allowed God, right? Bad words. But if he had humbly submitted to God, um, this miracle would have been, I think, in my opinion, even more amazing. Because thinking just for myself, you know, seeing these signs and, and wonders. Um, like, okay, yeah, I, I've seen stuff like that on TV. And, you know, people can trick your eyes. Um, you can do things to fool someone. And I think we'll see that later, that the magicians of, of Egypt can kind of duplicate these things. But if he had, had shown up and someone who was very clearly not able to speak, who was slow of speech and of tongue, all of a sudden was eloquent, was well-spoken, that would have been a very compelling miracle indeed. And God is even patient with that doubt. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a good speaker. Well, I'll help you with that. Now we get to the point where Moses basically just says, I just don't want to do this. That's when God gets angry. He is patient. With the doubts, he, he gives him answers for the doubts. He works through his doubt with him. But when Moses finally says, just please send someone else, then his anger is kindled. He still gives a solution, but he's angry with him. But he does not let Moses deny his plan or derail it. God's plan still moves forward. Then, uh, beginning in verse 21, we start to see this really cool lining out of everything that's going to happen. He tells him every, pretty much everything 
you'll see just make sure you do all the things before Pharaoh that I've told you to do all the miracles he says but I will harden his heart he's telling him ahead of time I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart and keep in mind Moses has not even returned to Egypt yet um, and God is already saying Pharaoh's heart will be hardened I will do it it's right here I will harden his heart so that he, that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, and then he starts talking about the firstborn son, that Israel is my firstborn son. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. We're seeing all the way to the end of the process here. Um, and I believe even beyond, because this talk of a firstborn son um, this works out throughout the rest of Scripture, all the way through Christ. These are, these are timeless, eternal concepts that are being laid before us in Scripture. A plan of redemption that goes far beyond just saving the Egyptians. I'm saving the Israelites from the Egyptians. All right, now we have something we have to deal with here this really confusing section in 24. Um, kind of like, okay, I understand, I understand, I understand. What in the world is going on here in 24? Why, at a lodging place on the way, did the Lord meet him and seek to put him to death? What? And why is it that his wife, Zipporah, then circumcises his his son and saves his life what does this even mean well um, I am <laughs> not a great Bible scholar I do believe that there are things that we can understand and things that we will not know everything in I think as we try to interpret difficult scriptures we must do so with humility and patience, understanding that what we think today may change as we read more scripture and we have a better understanding of that scripture. In this reading, having not done a lot of study on it, um, what stands out to me in this passage is that circumcision is the process that saves Moses' life. Moses is on his way to be the hand of God as God begins to fulfill a promise, a covenant made with Abraham. And that covenant included the promised land. And it um, included uh, being very... Uh, having a lot of descendants, right? Um, all of those things. So the descendants part is kind of, it's being fulfilled already. The promised land is on its way, or they're on their way. But Moses is going to be the hand of God in this. And what was the sign of that covenant that we read in Genesis 17, I think? Um, the sign of that covenant was circumcision. And it was required by God for all Israelite men to be circumcised, to be part of this covenant. Moses has not circumcised his son. He has, again, doubted God or perhaps allowed his wife's objections to circumcision override his duty to this covenant. And... God is saying, you are not respecting this covenant. I am sending you to help bring this covenant about, and you have not even respected it yourself. This has to be taken care of. As to why it's in here, I think we have to take God's word seriously. We have to take covenants with God seriously. And Moses, I think, is communicating that to us. And this um, bridegroom of blood 
Surely you are bridegroom of blood to me, she says. And, and, then, and then he has this thing at the end. Um, it was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. To me, it almost sounds like Moses is inserting this here because people, um, the Israelites were saying, you know, um, why is it that your wife called you a bridegroom of blood? She said that she called you that. What is that about? So he's explaining that we don't have that backstory. We're not, um, we're not in life. We're not doing life with Moses. But I wonder if this is inserted to explain something, something that he and Zipporah had talked about. The people heard them talk about why what's with this bridegroom of blood thing. He said, "Well, here's the backstory. This happened. I I had not circumcised my son, and I should have, and God." was bringing, his anger was kindled against me in this situation. And Zipporah, um, my life was saved because she did circumcise our son. And the rest, as they say, is history. But um, that's my take at this, this passage right now. Um, but with the acknowledgement that as I read more scripture, I may, we may have deeper understanding of passages like this. They certainly seem completely out of place when we first read them, but as you think about it, sometimes they are the most meaningful of, of all of them. Of, uh, well, not more meaningful, but they do their job in lending and aiding in understanding of the meaning of the passage. Um, so, and then the rest of the passage is, you know, Moses and Aaron come to the people, they show them the signs. And the beautiful part at the end is this. The people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. They know that God hears them and cares for them. They have hope. We must not let our doubts consume us. God knows we will have doubts, and he is patient with us in our doubts. Um, but we must not remove ourselves or try to remove ourselves from God's plan because of our doubts. Sometimes the things we are doubting are the very things God is going to use to work out his mighty plan. So my takeaway today is this. God meets us and patiently helps us through our doubts, but he will not allow our doubts to derail his plan. Let's pray. Father God, we confess to you that we have many doubts. We do not see far into the future, and we acknowledge that that is because you have designed it that way. You require us, require us to trust you. So God, please help us to do that. Help us to trust you. We trust that you will give us trust. We have faith that you will give us faith. Even those things are not of our own doing. We cannot muster up faith or trust or insight. Even the hardness of our hearts, according to this passage today, is in your hands. So, God, we just, we marvel at you and your plan, your, your grace, your mercy, and your patience, and your justice. And we submit to you, God. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. I will hopefully see you again soon.